Welcome, everybody. It's great to talk to you. I wish I could see you all, but this is the way it goes. So it's a great pleasure to be here today, and we're going to be talking about this new book, Fire Safe Use of Wood in Buildings. It's a global design guide. And this talk is from me. Colleen's name is there too, because we're going to be presenting a very similar paper in September to the Fire NZ conference in Christchurch. And uh, we've worked on this together a bit, and you'll hear from Colleen a, a little later on, as you shall see. But let's go to some background on this. The Global Design Guide, some simple questions. Why this design guide? Well, as you will have noticed, timber buildings are springing up everywhere. They're growing like crazy. And the main driver is the climate crisis and this demand of the building industry and others for low carbon design. And really the only way to build a, a zero carbon building is to put a lot of wood in it because of the carbon which is sequestered in the wood for the life of the building. That's the driver. Um, but it then creates problems because fire safety in all these timber buildings is not well understood. Um, and the building codes, which we all use, Building Code of Australia or the New Zealand Building Code, they were not written with large timber buildings in mind. It just was not on the radar when most of these codes were written. And so lots of changes are afoot, but we can't wait for the codes to change. We've got to start providing more information. There are lots of conflicting claims from all sorts of people uh, across a broad spectrum. Some people will say uh, timber buildings are safe because we can predict the charring. Others will say they're unsafe because the wood will keep burning. What's the right answer? It all depends. Some people will say, well, it's, we'll just hide all the wood and everything will be all right. And the others will say, no, no, we have to show all the wood and, and many, many others. So those are the, the problems that need to be addressed. I now want to say something about recent research. And there's been research all around the world motivated by lots of things, but especially in, the, in Canada and the USA, motivated by code changes and by concerns of firefighters and similar things in other countries. And recent research has addressed lots of questions about fire dynamics in mass timber compartments. And you'll hear from Colleen about that shortly. And all these questions about char fall off or delamination. We don't like to use the word delamination because it's, it's more appropriate to use char fall off. So that's the word we'll be using. But as part of that, there's a specification of, of the glue that's used in CLT and other products. And whether or not you get burnout, and I'll let Colleen address the question of burnout, but the, really a question of whether or not the fire will, will go out or will burn out to a level where it can easily be extinguished by the fire service. Um, a whole question about flaming, flaming out the windows, which affects the, the fire environment in the building and it affects the possibility of fire spread outside the building. So many, many issues. A bit more background. There's a network called the FSU network, Fire Safe Use of Wood, which is an informal network of global fire engineers and researchers. And it was, it's, this has been in existence for 10 or 15 years, largely managed by Birgit Ostman, who was the editor of a technical guideline for Europe 12 years ago, in 2010. And this informal network is something that Andrew Dunn and Colleen and I and about 15 or 20 others were engaged in a very informal way with telephone conferences and email exchanges, trying to come up with, with an international consensus 
as to what to do in timber buildings. And the Europeans got their act together and they produced this book in 2010. About the same time, uh, Michael Klippel and Andrea Frangi at the Technical University of Zurich in Switzerland, they got European EU funding for a very big study, a cost action, they call it, 1404. And that is the photograph of, of all the people at their one of their last meetings. And you can see Andrew Dunn standing there right in the center of the front row, along with a with hundred other researchers who were contributing to this work on fire safety and timber buildings. But all that stuff was being done in Europe. The Americans and the Canadians were going in different directions. We here in Australia and New Zealand were heading off in other directions and there was no collaboration at all. And I have to say that it's Andrew Dunn from the Timber Development Association who's hosting this. It was really his pressure that said, look guys, we've got to produce a global design guide. And we started work on that at least five years ago and, and, and finally we're there. And so this book, The Fire Safe Use of Wood and Buildings was published, became available last month, and that's what we're talking about. So what are the objectives of this book? Simple, to provide guidance on the design of timber buildings for fire safety, to cover the whole field of fire design issues, to summarize the results of recent research, to provide international consensus, and to guide code writers in other countries although it's really, it's aimed at designers, not at code writers, but it'll be useful to code writers. It's written by volunteers over this four or five year period with authors from Europe and USA and Canada and Asia and Australia. So contributors to chapters in Australia, Andrew Dunn, David Barber, Paul England, we're going to hear from all of those. Christian Maluk from University of Queensland was a co-author of my chapter in New Zealand. Me and Colleen and Ed Claridge, who's the, the fire, the principal fire engineer at Auckland Council, we all wrote chapters and we had help along the way from Tony Abu and Dennis Powell at the University of Canterbury and Kevin Frank at Brands. So lots of people involved. And in fact, there were 14 countries involved altogether. So let's have a quick look at the chapters. And I'm going to go through this very quickly. There's a list of the chapters and the chapter authors, and I'm not going to read through all that, but you can see there are people from the States, from Germany, from Estonia and Australia. That's the first eight chapters. And here's the last six chapters. Those are the, all the authors. <clears throat> so the book was published in July. <clears throat> there was some financial support from Brands and SFPE New Zealand, to, and that helped us to get a free online PDF. It was a great deal, actually, because the publisher in the US were the US British publishers. And they said, if you give us a, a sum of money, uh, I won't tell you just how much, but a significant sum of money, we will, we will sell the hardback version and we'll make the PDF as a free online download. So we collected that money from around, around the world and we paid the money and we now have that. So you can get this for free, but you can buy a hard copy for Australian 273 or New Zealand $300. So there's a full list of the authors. I'm not gonna dwell on those of course, but they're all there. And there are people from Russia and China and, and Japan included in that list. So I'm just gonna do now one slide for each chapter and just give you a sort of bang, bang, bang what's in the book. So the first chapter, timber materials, timber buildings written by Christian Dagenay in Canada, and it's stuff that most of you know anyway. What are these materials and what are the buildings that are being built around the world? So it's just background information that's, that's needed. Um, chapter two, I wrote chapter two, the fire safety chapter, and that's really an overview of fire safety in all buildings, but with a particular attention to timber buildings. So that those photos on the right, that's figure 2.1, figure 2.2 from the, from the book with different amounts of timber being exposed. And the problem simply is this, the architect wants to have slender, skinny wood elements 
all exposed to view the structural engineer wants massive timber elements and the fire engineer, massive timber elements, mostly hidden. And so the fire engineer often has to come in and <laughs> create a balance between those two demands. Um, Colleen's chapter is on fire dynamics, and I'm just going to put this, these slides here to show this is what happens in a piece of wood when it gets hot, and, and this is what happens to it as it dries out, and Colleen will talk more about that in the next few minutes. But that's, a, I'd have to say, that's a very important chapter because you, you can't understand fire safety in any building unless you know what the fire is going to do and what sort of fire you're working with. And that's where that chapter is so important. Then it, we move into the code area and Birgit Osman has produced a chapter, which is just a comparative chapter with lots of maps like this, looking at all the, buildings, sorry, all the countries of the world or many of them, and looking at, in this case, the maximum number of stories allowed with visible wood. And there's lots of graphs and charts and tables which just give an international comparison of the rules. And some of them, the rules are very similar and some are very different. Chapter five written by Mark Janssens at the, um, in San Antonio, Texas reaction to fire, and he is a world expert on the use of the rune corner, corner test and the cone calorimeter. And so there's a whole chapter there about restrictions on wood surface areas and the testing available and the surface coatings which are available and it refers to the New Zealand Australia group number requirements, which many of you will know about. So lots more detail in that chapter. Chapter six, separating assemblies. This is written by people at in Technical University of Munich. And these are just photos from this, looking at compartmentation and putting in shear walls. And then what kind of tests do you have to do? And designing assemblies with a fire resistance criteria, protective materials, encapsulation, calculation methods. It, it's all in there. Then we move on to chapter seven. I'm a structural engineer. This is a very important chapter written by Ala Just from, Australia, from Estonia. And it starts off with very simple stuff. What's, how much charring do you get? Under what conditions? Charring rates for protected wood and unprotected wood with a lot of reference to Euro Code, code 5. Very heavy reference to Euro Code 5, but it also gives a background to our joint standard ASNZS 1720 part four, which is the, the new version of 1720 part four, which was updated two years ago. So that's all in there. David Barber is gonna talk about connections. <clears throat> There's a couple of pictures from his chapter. He'll talk about design methods for nails and bolts and screws and lots of other things, including exposed steel and intermessent paint, which can be a problem. Chapter nine, is prevention of fire spread. This is rather similar to chapter six, but it's different. It's looking at possible paths of fire spread through a timber structure. And a lot of the details which fire engineers, good fire engineers will take care of in their day-to-day -day work, but with lots of help to prevent fire spread through junctions and penetrations and cavities, along with test methods. Chapter 10 is active fire protection sprinklers. And of, as we know, sprinklers are the best thing we can do. If they work, we have no flashover. We don't need any fire resistance, but we can't rely on them because you never know. Not enough water, they're down for maintenance. There's been an explosion or an earthquake. So we have to consider them not working. Chapter 11 is Paul's chapter on performance-based design. And among other things, he's going to, talk about objectives and fire scenarios and compliance and risk assessment, all but based heavily on the wood solutions design guides, which I would recommend very strongly. We'll hear from Paul shortly. Robustness in fire, this is really structural engineering for tall, big buildings. And this is all based on um, <clears throat> disproportionate collapse and how to design structures from a probabilistic point of view, looking at weak elements and structures so that we 
have alternative load paths and we can do some kind of analysis to make sure if a if one critical element in the building fails, the whole building, whole building doesn't collapse. So this is rather specialized for structural engineers, but it, there it is. Two more to go. Chapter 13, which Andrew Dunn managed on execution and control is all about installation and the quality of installation in fire and of installation of fire protection, passive and active and quality control and preventing construction fires. So quite a good chunk of work on construction fires because They've, around the world where there have been fire disasters and timber buildings, they've nearly always happened during construction. And so that's very important. And finally, chapter 14, firefighting and timber buildings. Ed Claridge from Auckland is looking at firefighting operations and, and how addressing concerns of firefighters with regard to combustible linings, void spaces, cavities, and pre-incident planning and wind-driven fires. So those are the 14 chapters and that's it. I'm going to stop there um, for a moment because by now you've got a pretty good idea of what's coming. So Andrew, shall I just carry on? Yes, we'll do it in order of the chapters, Andy. So you're, you're first up for chapter two. Okay, so what we're doing now is that I've just got a couple of slides going into a little more detail on chapter two because that's the chapter that that i was responsible for so chapter two fire safety and you, you saw this before um the architect wants to expose the wood the fire engineer wants to hide it good fire engineering is required and the answer to these questions are never simple um i've put a special section in the book on tall timber buildings uh, these four pictures on the right are all buildings which have been recently completed um, around the world, different countries. And the issues there are fire resistance and encapsulation and design for burnout and preventing delamination. But wait a minute now, I'm going to change two of these words. I've got here delamination and self extinguishment, but I'm just going to put a line through those because when we have glue lines which are affected by wood, we don't tend to have massive delamination, but we do tend to have increased rate of char fall off. So we'll call it char fall off. And the word self-extinguishment is actually, I've just spent a moment on this because in the early draft of our book, we had 14 chapters with 14 different authors and, and Birgit and I were trying to sort of manage the editing of this. And every author had a different definition of self-extinguishment. And we talked about this and largely with under some guidance from David Barber, we said, look, we're not going to use this word. It's a dangerous word because it means such so many things to so many different people. And if you do have a mass timber building with wood, which is charring in the building, you, there's no way that you can guarantee that that charring will stop at the end of the fire. Colleen will talk about burnout. The fire temperatures can drop close to ambient, but if you have a major fire in a, in a big timber building, the fire services are going to have to go in there at the end of the fire and make sure that extinguish the, the fire and the charring are extinguished because we can't guarantee that there will be such a thing as self-extinguishment. So for that reason, we don't use the word in the design guide, except for this kind of discussion in chapter two. Okay, so I'm nearly there. Chapter two also asks these big questions. What are we trying to achieve in timber buildings? Well, the same fire safety as in any other buildings, the same occupant safety and firefighter safety for rescue and firefighting, which means we need structure, to not collapse and fire separations to withstand burnout. We don't always need burnout because if we're designing a little house or, or a, a, a small building which where people can easily escape, then it all depends on the on the, the fire codes in the different countries. But burnout it becomes very important for 
visual occupancies where people can't get out and especially for tall buildings. So that at the end of the day, we need clear performance targets and a strategy to achieve them. And this design guide is not a building code, it's guidance and it's guidance to people who are using codes in different countries. And it's also guidance to people who are writing or modifying building codes. And in all of those, there'll be tougher rules for taller buildings, simply because the, even though the risk is very low, the consequences of failure are very high. So thank you all. I've stopped now. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to pass over to Colleen to talk about chapter three. Yeah, chapter three in the guide provi really provides an overview of fire dynamics in mass timber compartments. And it's really with a particular emphasis on fires where that mass timber is exposed. Um, my co-authors are shown on the slide. Uh, so thanks to Christian, Mikhail, Esco and Norman from scattered around different parts of the, the world. So what's covered in chapter three? Um, Oops, firstly, um, some basic information about the burning and combustion behavior of wood, and also a general introduction to uh, post flashover compartment fires. Um, we then have uh, a bit of an overview of some of the experimental research that's been done, mainly sort of looking at the past seven years or so. The chapter then draws out some of the particular characteristics of fires and compartments with exposed timber, which I'll come back to um, in the next slide. And there's a section discussing what it means to withstand burnout in mass timber construction. So that's, that's kind of a really important concept to understand, especially um, for performance-based design. The latter part of the chapter then covers some of the calculation methods available um, with some emphasis on the limitations. And then kind of the chapter ends with a, uh, a worked example for calculating the, the char depth and timber sections based on um, an iterative procedure to account for the actual the char contribution to, to the fire. So this next slide, um, it shows heat release versus time. It, it kind of illustrates some of what we know about fires and compartments and um, some of the differences between fires and non-combustible compartments um, compared to those in, in compartments with exposed timber. So if we just kind of have a look at the purple curve number one, that, that's kind of what we would typically see for a fire in a non-combustible compartment where sort of the contents only are burning actually as well as for a timber compartment where you might have all of the, the, the wood sort of covered up. Uh, and so we can kind of see you know, the fire grows, um, becomes fully developed, burns at kind of a peak constant uh, rate for a period. And then the fire decays as the combustible contents um, sort of burn away. Now the pink curve shows what can happen in a CLT compartment with um, some exposed wood where the kind of surface layer of the the CLT kind of burns through perhaps sort of later in the, the fire development. And then we start to get this char fall off that, um, that Andy was talking about. And then that char falling off then exposes um, kind of the next layer of CLT, um, provides some fresh fuel to kind of allow the fire to, to regrow. And the photo on the right kind of just illustrates um, what that kind of char fall off might look like. The third green curve is, is another possibility where we have a lot of exposed uh, wood. And that kind of provides more and more fuel to, sus to um, sustain the fire for a longer um, period. Now looking at um, ventilation controlled fires and compartments with lots of exposed wood kind of tend to generate the external flames that are taller and have a longer duration compared to non-combustible compartments. Um, heat fluxes to the facades are likely to be uh, higher as well, and that has some implication for the design of facades. It could also um, mean that the fire, risk of fire spread to nearby buildings could increase as well. So we need to take those into account. And Kind of just to summarise really some of the takeaway messages from chapter three, um, 
kind of firstly, we to withstand burnout, we need the, the fire to kind of reliably decay. And so that means we want the depth of char in the mass timber to kind of reach a plateau or, or a maximum value so that we, we're left with the residual section that can be calculated. We, we don't kind of want the charring to um, continue indefinitely. In design, we need to account for both the contents, the fuel load, as well as the charred wood contribution. We uh, might actually also need to cover up some of the, the timber to ensure that the fire will decay without uh, collapsing or, or kind of burning through. And having done all that, it's still unlikely that all uh, smouldering and hot spots can be completely um, eliminated or prevented. So we need to try and ensure that there's some manual extinguishment capability available after the fire and provide the, the resources and the water supply to, to enable that to happen. Um, and that's a real quick overview of what you're going to find in chapter three of the guide. So I'm going to stop sharing. Over to you, David. Thanks, everybody, for um, joining in the, and to find out some more about the guide. It's um, it was certainly a um, really interesting experience being part of uh, writing and authoring and um, being co-author on the guide. Um, this is a very brief introduction to the connections um, chapter, which hopefully um, everyone will be of interest um, in looking at, simply because we always have problems with connections on a lot of mass timber buildings. Um, and I think it's pretty evident from most of the way we construct buildings that connections can often be um, part of the, um, you know, certainly can be a problematic from an engineering point of view. Um, you know, I think we all realise that connections need to obviously um, ensure that the members that they are connecting um, provide the same level of fire resistance. And in some situations, obviously, they need to um, prevent the passage of heat and flames as well. And that's primarily related to um, the connections um, in panels, such as through with a um, CLT um, panel where we're joining, you know, two panels for a floor or a wall. Um, and in those sort of connections, there isn't um, an analysis method for those. So um, when we come to, you know, designing or checking or um, specifying connections for a CLT panel, um, they really have to be based on um, a fire tested solution simply because that's the only way we can really assess um, how the load impacts um, the different types of connections that we typically have. Um, for glue lamb, sort of beam to columns, beam to beam or column to column, and whether that's um, glue lamb, solid timber or LVL, you know, in some ways the design methods are similar. Um, if we do have exposed steel connections, we, you know, if there's a very minimal level of fire resistance that's needed for the building, we, we can have those exposed. Um, they still need to be checked, of course. But, you know, primarily for buildings where we need fire ratings of 60, 90, 120 minutes, we are looking at having a concealed connector. Um, and we'll either be looking at using the timber to provide that insulation and provide the fire resistance or providing some other protection um, to the actual um, timber members and the connection themselves to achieve the fire resistance. Um, there's two types of connections, um, proprietary connections, and these are ones where there's, you know, a company selling those and you can look at their website and obviously specify those and, um, you know, contractors can um, purchase those and, um, for certain projects and, you know, Rotha Glass, um, Megant, Simpson, um, uh, Rycom, you know, there's numerous suppliers which provide those and, you know, those really have either been fire tested or they have no fire test information. It's up to the designer to then um, carry out some analysis for those. Um, you know, obviously some connections um, will, as part of their actual design um, information, actually have um, and pro provide actual fire resistance reports. And then there are the non-proprietary connections, which are more sort of the project specific um, connections. And those are typically covered by uh, many other design guides as well and, and uh, numerous research reports um, because, you know, those are the ones where we have some level of um, testing, we have some level of engineering analysis um, that's not completely closed off from the point of view of being, you know, it's being a lot more transparent. Um, and again, that that is what a lot of the, um, the guide covers is some of those non-proprietary connections. Um, and of course, there are a significant amount of research papers out there looking at testing of different types of non-proprietary connections as well. Um, what we do see though, is that a lot of the connections are typically project specific. Um, and that is in some ways both sort of inefficient and costly for buildings. Partly that's driven by the way that um, some buildings are designed and the fact that um, you know engineers and architects end up needing to design um, connections for each building, 
Um, and sometimes it's simply because the information isn't available. And I think, which is, you know, an absolute shame, there are, you know, a lot of fire tests out there which have been carried out by um, developers, contractors, um, and certain um, suppliers where, you know, that information for the fire test report just sits collecting dust on somebody's server somewhere and isn't been made available, you know, for public information. Um, and that's, you know, somewhat disappointing because, you know, that information could be used by another project um, and could be the difference between that project having an efficient design and, and you know, reducing some of the cost to allow it to be viable. You know, a great example of that is the Ascent building in Milwaukee, which is, you know, just recently opened. It's a tallest mass timber building globally. Um, the connections for that are actually from the framework building, which was a project um, which didn't get built, but had a whole lot of fire testing for the connections and they were made available publicly. And so that information was used um, for the ascent building and it saved a significant amount of money um, for that project by using a publicly available um, connection fire test. So, you know, there is some very good um, reasons as to why, um, you know, if there is information on Biotestic connections that it shouldn't really be held and just collected somewhere. So, if anybody out there does have information um, and fire test, um, certainly contact you know Wood Solutions, myself, others, um, and we'll help you get that information out there and used by other projects. Just um, as a quick summary, and I won't go through through all these points. Um, you know, there is a lot of information in the chapter about just some of the watchets for how we design connections, and this is aimed at how we engineer those. It's aimed to, to be able to say, if you are engineering a connection, you know, here's the things you need to look at. Here's the the, the what the, the research has shown us. Here's what the, the fire testing has shown us. And this is what you should be looking for as far as whether you're designing, um, you know, a, a sort of a, a head and knife blade type connection with dowels, whether you're doing something which is uh, more of a bearing connection. Here's some of the ways to be able to design this. And this is just a video showing a um, completed to our um, glue lamb beam to column um, connection, which had just completed a fire test. I think, you know, there are some important aspects. I think we need to understand where we are looking at protection. Um, and certainly, I think, you know, where we're using paint, board, or spray products on a connection, we've got to be very careful the way we use those. Um, certainly, intumescent paint isn't a solution for an exposed steel connection. Um, and that's partly driven by the fact that, first of all, the intumescent paint um, has a lot of variability in the way that it will actually swell and actually protect um, the steelwork. And it is protecting the steelwork. It's typically not protecting the timber connector at all. Um, you may actually only get full activation you know, by 250, 300 degrees Celsius, which is typically far too late to help, you know, that connection actually protecting the timber. Um, and of course, it, it allows for heat to move into the, the connector. And you're not um, keeping the, the connection, the steelwork at a lower temperature. It is potentially allowed to heat up to, you know, 500, 550 degrees Celsius. So you've got to understand how, whether it's the paint or a board or a spray product actually allows heat into that steel connection to be able to then design it as a part of a a timber connection. The other part about it as well is that, you know, um, board and spray and the spray products typically stay pretty stable. Um, and, the, you know, the timber is actually reducing in size. And so when that occurs, when we've got an interface between the two, we end up having some quite significant gaps that can open up. And of course, those products may not actually be certified for use with timber as where you've got a steel to timber connection and, and the, you know, there is an external um, steel type connection. So I think, you know, we've got to be very careful the way we design for those. And so the, the, the guide also provides some um, information on those and, again, um, some, some ideas as to how to address those and also just to be ensure that we are designing connections to achieve the fire, right fire resistance ratings. Also, just like to thank my co-authors, of course, um, Tony and Andy and, and Christian and Michael. Um, we all had a significant role to play in writing this chapter, and I hope it's of use to you all. Um, I will now stop sharing and um, hand over to, uh, I think it's Paul next, isn't it? I'm just running through um, chapter 11, uh, which is performance-based design and risk assessment. Uh, th this really just provides an overview of holistic approaches uh, to derive fire safety designs and, and also to demonstrate compliance with fire safety objectives. Um, it considers um, uh, application of uh, timber construction in the latter stages of the chapter. And uh, essentially it provides a framework for, try, uh, for tying together all the other approaches described in the various chapters uh, when you're looking at a holistic fire safety uh, design. I just briefly mentioned uh, uh, that there were quite a large number of 
uh, co-authors. There's Colleen and David who are presenting today, uh, Daniel Brandon, uh, Christian Dagenar, um, uh, Gianluca uh, De Satis, Michael Klippel, who uh, did a, a fair amount, and uh, Dennis uh, Powell. Uh, so thanks to all those uh, authors. Okay, um, having a quick look at uh, a design process. This is a generic one, uh, which isn't specific to any particular uh, country uh, or design code. There are plenty of these around, which uh, um, uh, are probably more applicable to e each country, but this highlights the main stages. Uh, critical to have stakeholder involvement. Uh, also important to be looking at mandatory and voluntary objectives and constraints. So you, you may have uh, requirements for regulatory compliance, but there are also other objectives that you want to achieve, um, uh, such as uh, uh, reducing the carbon uh, uh, consumption of uh, uh, the, um, the building, all of which uh, uh, need to be considered. Uh, hazard analysis is a critical part of the process. Uh, then you select your appropriate methods of analysis, uh, appropriate fire scenarios and performance criteria. Uh, it's important to consider interactions of all parts of the fire safety uh, design and then provide accurate and comprehensive documentation uh, at the end of the process. So it's a very quick uh, run through. Um, looking at uh, pathways for demonstrating compliance uh, with the objectives, uh, it's important to remember that uh, and, and not forget the prescriptive pathway where you're looking at deemed to satisfy provisions. Uh, that might be simpler, simplest approach for some buildings. Uh, when you're looking at performance-based pathways, uh, I've broken the um, pathways up into Comparative studies where you're looking at comparing to an existing benchmark building and absolute where you're looking at uh, specified performance criteria and uh, satisfying those. Uh, essentially, for uh, whether you use comparative or absolute approaches, uh, we, we talk about uh, qu uh, quantitative uh, performance requirements, which are risk, which are risk based uh, uh, approaches and also uh, deterministic, which uh, on the face of it are not uh, risk-based, but they really should be looking at, at uh, inherently um, uh, considering risk. Um, it's important to make sure that a, a broad range of representative scenarios uh, are considered. The ones here are from the Australian verification method, which was a uh, uh, borrowed an awful lot from the New Zealand verification method, and th they both have similarities to US approaches. Um, the key thing is to be comprehensive with your scenarios, uh, but also uh, be efficient and tie as many together as, 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 as you can. And that leads to design fire scenarios. Uh, and this is an example which is sort of beginning to tie into some of the issues with uh, uh, timber construction. Um, you go through an incipient growth, fire, uh, fully developed, uh, de the decay phase and cooling phases. And the important thing to remember is that there are different stages that the fire brigade can intervene uh, uh, in these fires. And the extent and probability of success also depends on the stage. Uh, and the time of arrival. Uh, but obviously, if you have a fully developed fire, it, it's a lot harder to um, uh, control than uh, a, a growing fire or a fire that's in decay and cooling phase. Uh, in this uh, little example uh, in, the, um, uh, in the chapter, uh, there's a look at predicting uh, the frequency of ignition. Uh, in which case you're only looking at the intervention of fire brigade uh, uh, before flashover, but you can also then take into account uh, protection measures such as sprinklers, uh, um, small smoldering fires that don't develop, and uh, uh, also fires that remain small irrespective of the uh, uh, extent of intervention by automatic means or, or fire brigade. 
And from that, you can uh, come up with a, a frequency. And depending on your design and what you're looking at, you may really only want to focus on uh, flash over fires. So this then means that you can look at uh, 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 fewer scenarios, but in greater detail. And finally, uh, just uh, again, to give uh, uh, a flavor, there's, um, uh, this is looking at the estimates of probability of failure of structural elements and then uh, what that can mean. Um, uh, a key thing which has been spelled out by a number of major disasters is that it is necessary to consider failure of uh, uh, structural fire protection and uh, issues such as substitution of uh, 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 fire protective uh, panels, boards, spray material, et cetera. So uh, in this example, uh, you look at two uh, options. Uh, does fire protection uh, of the structural element have a gross defect? Uh, if it does, you can then get a premature failure. If it doesn't, uh, um, then you run on to uh, uh, looking at, at a longer period of failure. Uh, you then look at fire brigade intervention in all the various stages. Uh, and uh, sprinkler intervention if it occurs. But uh, finally, you then look at whether structural elements and barriers will fail uh, prior to uh, uh, control or extinguishment, and then you get probabilities uh, of, of failure and they evaluate the consequences of those failure. Um, a key thing here is that uh, um, encapsulated um, mass timber does particularly well if you have a premature failure of the protection system. Uh, and these, looking at things from a risk-based point of view, can highlight these. So that's a, just a, a brief example of uh, um, how the um, framework can be used. And I'll, I'll leave it there and pass back, I think, to Andrew now. Uh, my turn My turn now. Thank you, Paul. And, uh, and uh, I'll close out with the chapter 13 and chapter 13 is the building execution and control actually could um, segue from Paul you know, you can design whatever you like but unless it's um, put together correctly then it's um, uh, then it's got its own problems so the so this chapter looks at um, things as building execution and control and I like to thank my contributors which are Ed from Auckland Council, Esco from Finland, and Martin from UK and Brigitte Tosman from from Sweden. The chapter covers control of workmanship Fire safety during construction, which uh, Andy pointed out before, which is a uh, quite a large, a large issue to uh, consider, where where most of the timber has a, has a problem is going to occur during construction, and the responsibilities enforcement during construction. So it gives us guidance on how to how to look at those things and and what should be uh, put as a minimum into a into a building uh, building erection, and then folks talks about the fire detection, suppression, and emergency procedures that are recommended recommended for uh, for during construction. The quality of workmanship is vital, as we talked about before. The you know, timber buildings require certain precautions during the risk of great, great exposure to construction materials. Then you know, all, all the fire safety measures for the final building will be in place uh, throughout the construction and consequently adequate procedures are required to maintain the fire safety of the building site during, before and during, these, uh, during the installation of these systems. Uh, the information was drawn heavily from the previous, previous European guide. Uh, the Wood Solutions Guide, Guide Number 20, Fire Precautions During Construction in Large Buildings, as well as the UK version of similar thing and uh, in the in a, in a Zurich University um, version of this. So, the, so you'll see that there's um, uh, similarities between all of these, which have been really summarised in this chapter. And that kind of like concludes that uh, talk on that chapter is a very short one, but I'd like to just to remind people uh, where you can get this book. And uh, this there is a link on the screen, but but I just suggest to, to you just to Google fire safe use of wood in buildings, global design guides, and uh, you'll quite quickly go to where, where that um, book is available. And remember, there's a, there's a hard copy version, which is, a, which is available to buy, but there's a three, down, a three PDF download version, which I uh, highly recommend. And uh, I'd like to thank you in, in summarizing is the, uh, a big thank you to all the contributors of, of, this, uh, of this guide. You know, it said there's 14 countries involved, um, multiple, uh, multiple uh, contributors from each country. And, uh, and then especially a big thank you to Brigitte Osman and Andy Buchanan, who was the editor who drew all of this, just imagine all of the differences in, in opinions from around the world into this final guide. So thank you very much to, 
to Radit and Andy to, to produce the final book. And we're now into the, running, running to the end of the, um, uh, the uh, webinar and we have a, a little bit of time for some questions and answer. So the, um, please write your questions into the Zoom Q&A section and we have uh, the number of them there. And I'd, I'd like to, the, uh, the first, two, first two questions about whereabouts you got the book. So just remember, just on Google, Google that. And Joseph asked the questions, where a mass timber building does burn out, on some floors, is there a ability to remove the char by sandblasting or similar back to the substrate, still allowing the structure to be reused without demolishing existing design structures? So, so uh, Andy, you want to have a go at that question? Yeah, this, this, the short answer is, is yes. Um, it all depends, of course, how much, uh, how much char there is, but we've had buildings in New Zealand where the buildings with significant char, can, it can be sandblasted off. But 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 it all depends on, on the, the level of damage. It's also worth recognizing that if you have a light timber frame building, which is protected by drywall, gypsum plaster, even if you have a, a when one of those lightweight timber structures passes a fire test, uh, it doesn't mean there's no charring. So if you have a fire in a timber building, a serious fire, you would have to take off all the lining materials to make sure that there's no significant charring behind them. So short answer is they can be repaired, but it all depends on how much damage there is. I'll just add that to that, Andy. There's a good um, research done by TF2000 back in the... Uh, late 90s, where they did look at the, they tested a, a timber building, a steel building, a concrete building, and looked at the various damage that occurs during to real fires in the building. So it's worthwhile going back and look at that research and show you exactly what levels are different. Does anybody else want uh, to I could add just to add, add to that. Um, just last year, there's a, um, a report that's been published by RISE in Sweden by um, Daniel Brandon and colleagues on post-fire rehabilitation of CLT. So if you just kind of have a look at the RISE website, um, there sh should be some good information on there as well. Paul and David, any comments? No, nothing me. I was just going to raise that, right? Raise the, the, the RISE information, which is, um, which Colleen's just raised, discussed as well. So I think that's the most useful information. There is a few other research projects in the US which have looked at rehabilitation, but it's a little bit more. Um, specific to certain parts of CLT, but certainly there is a, there is more work being done on um, sort of the rehabilitation of CLT. I think that's um, a little bit more interesting, given that um, there is a you know larger panels, bigger area. So, okay, just uh, moving on, to, and probably one for you, um, for Paul. Uh, Jack's asked: Is there a standard fire test such as Fifteen thirty part four, which is designed to test the fire resistance level of materials that are not considered to be combustible, a valid method of testing timber construction. Okay, well, the the, the first thing is that uh, AS fifteen thirty part four does include uh, quite a bit of content about how to test timber using it. So uh, it's a little bit unfair to say that it's it's not necessarily be, being thought about. Uh, uh, testing combustible materials. Um, essentially, 1530 part four is a test method that exposes elements to uh, a heat flux, uh, uh, an overpressure, and uh, also an oxygen deficient atmosphere. So the, the simple answer is that the exposure is a scenario, a particular fire scenario exposure. Um, in reality, you get the same sort of thing in an enclosure, which is ventilation controlled. If you've got uh, um, uh, contents that are, are sufficient to consume all the oxygen, um, you end up with an oxygen deficient uh, uh, environment. So uh, it, it is a scenario. It doesn't mean that it should be the only scenario that you look at, but the same applies to uh, non-combustible materials that might be sensitive to different heating rates, etc. So you really need to be considering, uh, and certainly in tall buildings, 
uh, exposure to a number of different uh, uh, profiles and with timber, certainly different oxygen contents. If, if you've got a fuel control fire, you're going to have more oxygen and you'll get a different uh, burning rate to um, uh, 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 a low oxygen environment. So the answer is it's a test method uh, and there are others that should be applied to timber, but it also applies to other materials. Thank you, Paul. And unfortunately, we're running out of time, so I'm going to call a close to the questions questions for this webinar and and just uh, finish finish up on it. Uh, but I'd like, I'd like to thank thank all the speakers speakers uh, for this presentation. And just see, there was a question in one of the thing about the uh, CPD questions, and that's not the CPD question. Uh, they they will be available on the um, on the certificate of attendance. The just want to to remind that we Wood Solutions now back to, to conducting uh, live seminars. So the first one that we're doing is in Canberra on 3rd of September, and it's going to be held within a five-story timber building at the Mary Ray Building in ANU University. So please uh, go to Wood Solutions event webpage, and uh, you'll be able to be able to uh, register and attend attend that one and find out what's on the program. And I'd like to finish up and just to uh, remind you that the next uh, webinar will be on, on Tuesday, the 6th of September at 11 a.m. And this one's going to be on internal timber lining systems for commercial and public buildings compliance specification. And we have a uh, well known Boris Iskra from Wood Solutions, obviously, going to talk about uh, compliance, and Barnaby Napier from Sculpt Form is going to talk about their excellent systems they have. So that'd be an interesting uh, webinar. So at this point in time, I'd like to thank my fellow uh, speakers. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to have all this uh, high level input for fire and timber design and uh, thank the audience for attending. And at this point in time, I'd like to um, uh, say thank you and see you at the next webinar.